This time, the Chinese Communist Party's military really got played by the U.S. Department of Defense. In July, U.S. military experts discovered a sunken CCP conventional submarine in a shipyard on the midstream of the Yangtze River. But on September 26, the Wall Street Journal revealed a bombshell. It wasn't a conventional submarine, but the CCP's first small nuclear-powered submarine, and it sank in the spring. What's worse, it was confirmed by the U.S. Department of Defense. Xi Jinping's weapons are just as unreliable as Russia's flashy but dysfunctional gear. Now China's so-called priority weapon, this small Orca-class submarine, is going to be delayed by another two or three years. This is huge. The Americans can somehow get precise intel from within the CCP military. The CCP has always claimed that its nuclear submarines are primarily built in Huludao in northeastern China, but the Americans know full well that the Wuchang shipyard in the Mid Yangtze River has started working on nuclear submarines. It's pretty clear now. Key nuclear submarine maintenance bases have already been quietly moved inland. The U.S. Department of Defense released this information at this time, likely to remind everyone that the CCP has been gearing up for war for quite some time, and the shadow of war is drawing near. The real question is, how capable is the CCP Navy? Can they stand up to the real firepower of the Democratic Alliance? That remains to be seen. In July, Thomas Shugart, a researcher at a U.S. think tank and a former submarine officer, spotted a submarine in satellite images at the Yangtze River dock in eastern Wuhan. In late May, the submarine was still being fitted out, but within days, it mysteriously disappeared. By early June, four large floating cranes were captured in satellite images, lifting the sunken submarine from the riverbed. On July 21st, the Liberty Times reported that satellite photos showed the dock had shifted, suggesting that the submarine likely tipped to its side. Taiwanese expert Su Ziyun believes this may have been caused by an improperly balanced center of gravity, highlighting how, despite China's booming shipbuilding industry, its newer ship classes are still not as advanced in design or outfitting as those of leading nations. The Wall Street Journal also pointed out that China's past nuclear submarines were primarily built at the Huludao shipyard in Bohai Bay. However, the Wuchang shipyard on the Mid Yangtze River now covers three kilometers of riverbank and spans less than three square kilometers, with two outdoor and four indoor shipyards. They build ships under 30,000 tons, with an annual production capacity of 18 vessels. The shipyard is currently constructing 9A submarines and 056A frigates. Wuhan is also home to the Number Two Ship Design and Research Institute, known as the 719 Institute, which is the only overall design research institute for nuclear-powered ships in China. The truth is, the CCP's nuclear submarines are only assembled in parts in these shipyards. Other crucial steps are completed in locations scattered hundreds of kilometers apart. For instance, with this 041 class submarine, the hull was built in Wuhan, but it's transported elsewhere for fitting. The nuclear power engines are installed in one location, nuclear fuel is added at another, and missiles and other weapons are fitted at different sites. Currently, nuclear fuel is injected into the submarines at the Tianwan nuclear power plant in Jiangsu. To prepare for war, the CCP is ramping up nuclear power plant construction near Wuhan in Hubei and Hunan provinces. But what's the point? Dragging submarines inland for repairs or hauling them out from the interior? By the time they manage that, the CCP's submarines will likely be decimated at sea. Once they lose control of air and sea, they won't even be able to hold the coastal regions. Building nuclear submarines inland won't help at all. The CCP has completely misread the future. This is the result of years of never fighting wars. It's all just theoretical at this point. Why doesn't the CCP complete production and assembly all in one place? The reason is simple: they're terrified of internal sabotage, leaks, or even defections. They make sure that the technicians installing the missiles don't know the ones handling the nuclear fuel, and those installing the nuclear fuel don't know the ones fitting the engines. Each step is isolated, so even if there's a breach at one point, no one can compromise the whole production chain. If everything were done in one place, the CCP would be. 
be worried that a fully armed weapon could be hijacked and used against them. Imagine a nuclear missile launched straight at Zhongnanhai. In response to this major technical disaster, the CCP has been desperately covering up. On September 27th, when the Chinese Foreign Ministry was asked about the reports, the spokesperson only responded with, I don't know. Both the Chinese military and local authorities have remained silent. A senior official at the U.S. Department of Defense commented, It's no surprise the CCP Navy is trying to cover this up. After all, it's already embarrassing enough that a nuclear submarine sank, not in the sea, but in a river, and even before it left the shipyard. This scandal is a new low for the CCP, and they definitely don't want international media scrutinizing it. The U.S. Navy doesn't think too highly of the CCP's submarines either. The Americans believe the CCP's conventional submarines are better in numbers and stealth than their nuclear ones. Indeed, China's nuclear submarines are lagging far behind. They currently only have nine active 093A attack submarines, with seven more 093Bs still in testing, and the 095 class is still under construction. That's nowhere near enough. Plus, these behemoths, all over 7,000 tons, are built for deep sea operations. They're useless for shallow water missions like lurking, recon, or ambushes. The CCP's 039A conventional submarine, modeled after France's 2,700-ton Rubis-class submarine, ended up with a displacement of 3,600 tons underwater and is supposedly capable of shallow water operations. But in high-intensity combat, it would have to surface every three to five days to breathe, recharge, and refuel. So the CCP tried to upgrade the 039A into the 041 class, adding nuclear power, bumping up the displacement to 4,000 tons, and giving it an X-shaped tail for agility in shallow waters. Now, the CCP plans to build 30 of these small Little Orca-class nuclear submarines, hoping they can chase down U.S. and Japanese surface ships, outclass conventional submarines, and dominate the underwater battlefield of the first island chain. However, with this debut disaster of their small nuclear submarine, their underwater combat capabilities have hit a major roadblock. Western military officials have pointed out that after recovering a damaged submarine, cleaning and repairing it is a time-consuming process. Back in 1969, the U.S. had a nuclear submarine sink at a dock, and it took 32 months to repair. The problem here is, this is the first of its kind, so it could take even longer to fix. Meanwhile, the CCP only has nine attack submarines to hold the line, which will likely remain the case for the next two to three years. This official also noted something crucial, anti-corruption efforts within the PLA. Every time there's an incident in the CCP military, it becomes an excuse for a purge, and the Navy is no exception this time. A lot of issues will likely surface, and the impact could go far beyond just the repair schedule for the submarine. The overall combat effectiveness of the Navy could be affected as well. In contrast, Western countries use unmanned submarines in shallow waters. Why? Because once a submarine is exposed in shallow waters, it's as good as dead. The CCP knows they're being strangled by the U.S. on chip and AI development, so they came up with a manned small nuclear submarine, hoping to switch to an unmanned version when AI advances. Sure, a small nuclear-powered submarine has plenty of power, but it also generates a lot of noise. Fire off a few torpedoes or cruise missiles, and its location would be blown wide open, turning it into a sitting duck for anti-submarine weapons. Building more of these just means sending their submarine crews to die. Who are they trying to fool? It's clear that the CCP doesn't care about losing lives. Remember back in May when a Chinese Type 59 tank exploded during a test in Chittagong, Bangladesh, killing one and injuring two? Or how Pakistan reported that their Chinese-supplied tanks had leaking engines? Or even the frequent breakdowns experienced by Chinese warships that were exported? These issues reflect the poor quality of the CCP's equipment. If they had to operate at full scale in combat, especially in continuous 24-hour operations, there's almost no chance they could hold up. When the weapons don't work, the only option left is to throw lives at the problem. That's the CCP's playbook. Just like in the Battle of Chosin Reservoir or the Spring Offensive in the Vietnam War, sacrificing people is the only trick they've got, just like their Russian counterparts. 
The sinking of the 041-class nuclear submarine happened back in May, and it was already reported in July. So why bring it up again now? Clearly, the U.S. military wants to expose the CCP's recent attempts to flex its muscles. On September 25th, China launched an intercontinental ballistic missile, which was the first time in 40 years. Usually, these long-range missiles were tested within China's borders, but this time they targeted the open waters of the Pacific. Xi Jinping seems determined to show off military strength, aiming to intimidate the Asian Pacific region. This is really outrageous. Just on September 10th, Admiral John Aquilino from the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command had a video meeting with General Wu Yanan, commander of the CCP's Southern Theater Command. Aquilino told the CCP they needed to change their dangerous coercion tactics in the South China Sea and stressed the importance of continued dialogue. And what happened? Two weeks later, China launched missiles to show off. This was also likely a response to Russia's failed test of the Sarmat intercontinental ballistic missile on September 19th, which exploded before launch, leaving a 60-meter crater and marking their fourth consecutive failure. Russia's nuclear threats instantly fell apart. So China saw the opportunity and stepped in with its own attempt. But Putin wasn't idle either. He proposed that if Russia or Belarus faced a large-scale conventional attack, Russia could resort to nuclear weapons to scare Ukraine and NATO. The U.S. Department of Defense didn't play along and instead used the sinking of China's nuclear submarine as a tool, specifically revealing that this 4,000-ton attack submarine wasn't just equipped with traditional 533 millimeter torpedo tubes; it also had the JL-2 submarine-launched missile, capable of an 8,000-kilometer range. The message couldn't be clearer. While it's somewhat reasonable to use torpedoes to hit nearby ships, 8,000-kilometer missile is clearly aimed at the U.S. Land-based missile silos have already been locked down by U.S. satellites, so now China wants to use mobile submarine platforms to launch missiles near their coast, with the potential to strike the U.S. at any time. It's a blatant attempt to provoke the U.S. Americans found this amusing. Despite not having fully developed submarines for launching the 8,000-kilometer JL-2. The Chinese are already so arrogant. Then, on September 26, they brought up the news of the 041 submarine sinking, specifically pointing out that it was a nuclear submarine, bursting the CCP's bubble. With the sinking of this small Orca platform, it'll take years for them to recover. The message is clear: the CCP's weapon systems are just as unreliable as Putin's. Of course, just because the CCP's weapons are unreliable. Doesn't mean that Xi Jinping won't strike first in the Western Pacific. Last year, a war game by the U.S. Naval Academy found that collisions between the U.S. and Chinese ships and aircraft were on the rise, especially in the Taiwan Strait. The simulation predicted that by the end of 2025, a Chinese naval vessel could collide with a U.S. destroyer in the Strait, sparking a war. Given the increasingly tense situation, Taiwan has been stepping up its preparations. On September 26, Taiwan's President Lai Qingde personally chaired the first meeting of the Defense Resilience Committee. The core message was clear: no matter what flies in the air or explodes on the ground, Taiwanese society must hold firm, and the government must continue to function. There's no room for collapse after just a couple of hits. In terms of air raid shelters, Taiwan currently has 83,800 locations where people can seek refuge during attacks. If an air raid comes, there will be places for people to go. Additionally, there are 4,601 temporary shelter sites and 6,042 emergency shelters. So even if homes are destroyed, people won't have to sleep on the streets. The Civil Defense Department has also coordinated. With the medical association to set up emergency aid stations, and they plan to involve private clinics to ensure the healthcare system doesn't collapse. The Ministry of Health and Welfare has already taken stock of medical supplies, and critical items like blood bags are being produced at an accelerated rate to avoid shortages during wartime.
Next, each village and district will establish supply distribution points using supermarkets and convenience stores to distribute goods. The 368 township and district offices will be responsible for distributing strategic and living supplies, ensuring that even in times of war, people can still eat and drink. They also plan to mobilize 400,000 citizens to ensure that civilian life and essential government functions don't collapse. In response to the frequent harassment by Chinese drones, Songshan Airport has installed a drone defense system, and the Ministry of Transportation plans to equip Taoyuan and Kaohsiung airports with similar systems by the end of this year, preventing the CCP's drones from causing further disruption. With Taiwan making such extensive preparations, the signs of war are becoming increasingly apparent. Let's take a step back and discuss some of the more bizarre and unexpected stories behind the military scenes. Since Xi Jinping took power in 2012, military spending has skyrocketed, and the navy has been churning out ships like a production line. China now boasts the largest fleet in the world, but when it comes to tonnage, they still lag behind the U.S. That's not the real issue, though. The real problem is the string of accidents at sea: ship doors being ripped open by waves, carrier-based planes failing to land properly, and sadly, several pilots losing their lives. The U.S. Department of Defense revealed that in May 2023, a 094A class 421 strategic nuclear submarine experienced a malfunction 800 kilometers west of Guam and was forced to surface. The CCP's reactors are radioactive, so whenever the submarine is on a long voyage, all crew members must undergo daily radiation checks. They're even required to strip down completely, wear sunglasses, and sit under ultraviolet light for five minutes. If they don't, they could experience total hair loss, and some of the younger sailors even risk going bald. Although the CCP is working hard to fix these issues, the arms race has long since moved past simple mechanization. This is the digital age now. AI, advanced chips, and all those critical technologies are firmly in the hands of democratic nations. The CCP has taken a big hit in this area, but that's not to say they're sitting idle. They've outfitted their J-20A with a domestically produced WS-15 engine, hoping to challenge the U.S. military's F-22 and F-35. But the result has been engine burnouts and overheating. In one incident, a young ace pilot encountered a UFO and couldn't keep up with it. One of the engines burned out, and the other overheated. Six months later, the same pilot came across a UFO again. He deployed everything he had: air-to-air -air missiles, infrared tracking, radar. But the UFO didn't react at all. The pilot's missile almost boomeranged and hit his own plane. Then came a third encounter using a test flight of the J-35 team. This time, the same young pilot flying an empty J-20 crossed paths with a UFO again. But this time, things got really interesting. He received a message in English. Upon closer inspection, it turned out to be a secret U.S. Air Force plane, the TR-3B. The pilot was stunned. There was no way he could win. If they engaged, it would be a sure defeat. So he quickly shut down communications and, trusting his instincts, flew towards Taiwan, where he successfully landed. Of course, this story was never made public, so let's just treat it as a legend. It seems fate has a way of making the CCP stumble at critical moments. Clearly, relying on technology alone isn't enough. You need a bit of luck from above. Unfortunately, luck doesn't seem to be on their side. 